you will ask yourself, how am I going to restore it? Am I going to break it down? What type of material I'm going to use? So all of this, it's so heavy for any type of human being, including you and me. We actually don't have a better appreciation of how are we going to do for the next step because everything is in our brain and we're working on so many different parties of information. For the conventional dentistry, that, that's actually the downside of what we have because we have very limited um, platform for us to, to foresee the future plan. We capture all this information, we see it through our eyes, and we use a lot of our imaginations to describe it to your patient first, to tell yourself what you're doing, and also talking to your team members, including your interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary doctors, as well as your laboratory technicians, trying to get the control of the cases to first coming up with something like that. You're trying to foresee the future teeth are going to be by establishing your diagnostic wax. This is very difficult, as everybody knows. That's why we go through our training for so many years, but still we could, you know, we're trying to do a better job on this. Once you have that, then of course you want to proceed your definitive treatment. But everything that as I break it down over here from your data acquisition data collection to the design of the cases until the manufacturing part. The conventional dentistry, literally, we're talking so much about the uncertainty, which is how the digital dentistry actually benefit you right now. Starting from data collection, of course, you can have a lot of fancy tools. You can scan your cases, not only teeth, but also the face. But at this point, I, I think the value of the scanning, it's very crucial. But what I found the best for you to benefit from all of the digital workflow is actually at this point, at this era of 2020, you actually don't need to struggle on using your brand, using your imagination, talking to everybody, trying to get everybody to understand you. You can actually just planning on the software and just indicating on where or what's the procedure you are going to do in the future and then come up with the very control way of the setup that everybody really understand you and the surgeon really knows where they're gonna plan the implant. So as you can see the workflow that now here it's been break down, each of the part of course, it's heavily uh, utilizing the digital part right now. So this is the background that I would like to share with you how the digital dentistry has been evolved and it actually provides some benefit and features for just to make your life be a bit easier and make your patient also appreciate you more because they will feel that you know what you're doing. So getting back to the topic that we're gonna, we're gonna talk about, the full arch implant rehabilitation. So getting into the digital, it's so not easy. We actually need to have some strategy to make it accurate. As what I said, we want to plan it, in, we want to execute it. But once we executed it, we wanted to just follow by your plan, not just by the software that you plan, but being very off. So that's the feature what we actually start to use, me and my team, we also just like Dr. LaRosa, we start to use this navigation system in 2017, build it into my digital workflow that I will introduce you uh, just in a couple of seconds. The feature of the navigation system, it's just like you're using AB every day, the Google map, the GPS. So the GPS, the feature of it is that you can number one, following the GPS, this map, you can easily go getting from spot A to spot B. So it navigates, it tells you where the direction is going to be. But what's more important for the feature of the GPS is not only that you can go to the direction following, you can get to the destination following by your plan, but also you have the constant feedback while you're getting to the destination. So you can see what's going on through the map, you know, whether you have traffic or you need to detour to it. So the constant feedback, the lifetime of the feedback, avoiding the problem, that's also the main feature of why we're using the navigation system. We, will, we love this machine not just because it looks really fancy, right? It's like high-end fashion, but more important, 
we would like to, this machine to work as its best function. We want to have this high accuracy, especially dealing with the cases as I just keep on talking about. We don't have landmarks. So the feature of the machine, um, as you can, as you have been probably narrow through the website or through a lot of introduction, it compels with three major parts. First, we plan on our cases. Then we have to synchronize your patient to your plan accurately so you can finish and carry on the last procedure, which is placing your implant and everything just follow as the plan. That being said, incorporating this dynamic surgical approach, here is the um, workflow that I mentioned earlier that I would like to share with every one of you guys. Following by this cookbook, it's this recipe, you can actually start your new cases, I would say, probably from tomorrow. So the breakdown of it is that for the first part, you can see from left to right, left side, you can see starting from data collection, you need to have your scan, you have to have collect all the prosthodontic core value of the data that you start to restoring teeth, putting your teeth back so you can have your virtual diagnostic wax up. Then carrying on the virtual wax up, superimposed with your cone beam CT, then you can just executing as what I just addressed, the planning part through the Navigant software. And then you carry out the surgery through the soft, uh, through the Navigant software, just, just as you can see the workflow at the top row towards to the right. For the bottom side, uh, you can also see that's the prosthetic workflow following parallelly by your plan, which is after you plan your cases through the Navigant software, where you plan your implant, future implant is going to be um, following by your restoration, sorry. Then now you can start to go back to manufacturing your pre-prep provisional shell. As you can see on the photo in the middle, that it actually has the pre-corresponding implant holes that's been pre-drilled. So avoiding a lot of problem that during the surgery or after the surgery that you want to start executing the immediate low protocol that you spend like probably two, three hours just drilling out those holes and just figuring out where you're going to seat the full arch template, which is very which is very labor intensive, very exhausting, and also it's exhausting to the pa for the patient also, and you contaminate a lot of your wound site. So this is the plan and the execution of the workflow that I would like to share with you. And now I'm gonna dig in more about how we're gonna actually following this plan, because the plan sounds good, but we actually want to make sure that steps can following through with the high accuracy as I keep talking about. If the plan is just something in the software, not correlated to the actual scenario, it's not going to work. So how are we going to achieve the high success? There are a couple features of that to make it really work, you know, has 100% of the charts. Number one is the, in the planning part, I, I break it down into the couple details that I will show you later. And you have to trace it in a high accuracy way that only on a couple features. You place your implant as the plan, but you always need to verify the accuracy through the surgery that you're carrying it out. So as the last part for your immediate templarization, the provisionization, that's the easiest part as the end. So as you can see, the first part of the plan, you scan your patient, you have the scan data, you have your combing CT, which has to be without too much artif uh, artifact, too much scattering, too much false information. So then you superimpose both of the information, the skin file that you carry on to design your teeth, the wax up with the comping CT so you can plan. So the key steps for this part is you have to have both of the three column, the red column to be accurate. The second part of the trace is you also have the key steps to following by. Number one is you have to adapt the trackers the tracker is just like a GPS. So first you adapt the trackers on your patient, you, just like you're holding on your cell phone accurately with you. So that locates yourself, your patient to the 
machine. So it synchronized both of the information together. So the tracker is very important to adapt on your patient solidly. During the surgery, it should not be able to move up and down. Otherwise, you lose the control, lose the synchronize of the information from the patient. So that's important. And then you want to trace the patient before you, uh, you, you want to uh, calibrate your patient to the machine. So meaning that you need to trace your patient and then you always want to verify the accuracy. The third part will be placing the implant during the surgery. Dr. La Rosa, she's gonna introduce you the surgical procedure in the future. I'm sure she's gonna talk about how, what's the trick about you during the surgery, you're gonna concentrating on um, checking upon the machine, checking upon your anatomy. But what's more important before you're checking upon your surgical procedure, you have to make sure that at this moment, your patient, the information in the machine is synchronizing. It's, it's linking to your patient accurately. By saying so, you need to always verify the accuracy. You need to calibrate it and always do your accuracy check. So that you can, based upon that, you can carry out the precise surgery. And the last part of this is said, if you're following by all the three steps, the red, the yellow, the green properly, then the last step as your pre-designed full arch shell with those corresponding holes has been pre-drilled, supposed to fit and find your implant position pretty accurate. And the last part of which typically you need to spend like five, four, five hours to pick up all those implants. It's now turned into maybe like an hour and a half. You can finish it within time, you know, very with high efficiency. So uh, these are the key crucial steps that typically I will dig a lot into just to tell you, walk you through what's more the most important part. But today, due to the time frame, of course, we don't have so much time. So I'm going to focus only on the first step, which is the plan. So the plan, as I keep on talking, keep on addressing, First, you need to make sure your scan file is accurate. For full mouth rehab cases, we have very limited landmarks that we are going to calibrate it in. So uh, I will break it down into two different cases type. One is you have a couple teeth that you probably can be utilized. The second one is you just don't have nothing. And I will tell you how you're going to get the accuracy through each different type of cases. The second part is the convenient CT. The CT, you're not just taking it, just without no burner. You have to double check upon the quality of the CT, whether it's providing you the validated bone quantity, bone quality, and also registering some information, some fiducials or some landmarks for you to do the third step, which is superimposition, both of the image, the scan, your design to your CT data. So let's start with the scan. Um, in 2020 today, based upon majority of the scientific data, the cross tooth scanning, meaning that when you have only partial edentalism, but it's tooth form majority, the scanning procedure is pretty accurate. According to the literature, it can be up to, it can be accuracy up to five to couple, like 20 to 25 uh, micron of the accuracy for the majority brand of the intraoral scanner. So for the, you know, single tooth or quadrant, just like a small bridge, we wouldn't worry about the, the error of the scan file. However, when we start to have the full arch um, implant restoration, or we have very limited of the landmarks, just as what I show on the screen, these type of cases, for the full arch scan, with limited landmarks, um, the literature shows, uh, especially from Dr. Um, Randy Masri, they're the team of University of Maryland. They published a very good data that you can go check upon. For the turning arch, uh, full arch, not fully edentalism, but also with limited landmarks, the scan accuracy can be around only 100 to 150 microns especially at the turning corner, which is canine area of the skin, it can be up to almost 150 to 200 of the error only, uh, of the accuracy only. So for that, we have to remember in mind, scanning the full arch implant cases at this point without um, 
featuring a couple more landmarks in between the edentulous, in between the implant and the edentulous area. It's not going to bring you that accurate, that high accuracy when you need to executing the definitive prosthesis, not even the provisional. So we're trying to avoid at this point, I wouldn't say in the future that you cannot execute it, but at this point, I would try to avoid it. So even for this case type, scanning full arch um, with scanning full arch cases with limited landmarks is difficult. Not to talk about scanning full arch existentialism. Now, according to literature just published in 2019 by Dr. Park and their group, uh, it can be up to 300 or more of the accuracy, which is very limited, it's not as accurate for now, scanning for complete edentulism. So what we're doing right now to get a better accuracy of the scanning type, because you want to execute, as I keep on nagging to you guys, we want to have the accuracy through the planning so you can follow this accurate plan to execute the procedure. In order to achieve a better accuracy for your scan, we actually have a better way right now to solve the issue before the scanner improve their scan accuracy. So here is what we're doing right now. If the patient has a previous denture or they're just complete dentalism, we will make a quick uh, 3D printing denture or utilizing their previous prosthesis. We will then reline the um, complete denture, the integral surface to get a bad, better um, tissue adaptation then we actually scan the denture with the intaglio. So we reverse engineering back the edentulous area. In this way, um, we can literally get a high accuracy of the edentulous area, better than you just scanning straight through the complete edentulism uh, intra-early. So this is the trick I would like to share with you guys. So carry on to the second part for coping safety. What's the trick of the combing CT we have to be aware of? Number one is when we're taking CT, if you're going to utilize the navigation system. Um, as I just break it down for you guys, you need to recalibrate it. And calibrating meaning you have to trace it, you have to do some accuracy check. You need the teeth not be, to be recognized. So you don't want the teeth to sort of just clench to each other. When the patient is taking the CT scan, you have to make sure that the teeth is slightly separate. So the machine can recognize the teeth better by synchronizing your bone data to your scan data. So that's crucial. I, of course, I know that um, Navident, Clarinoff, they're improving the software right now. Sometimes when you just don't have the separation, you can now being able to, I think it's in, still in the trial, but you can be able to register uh, supreme position better at this point. But still, I would recommend you when the patient needs to take this data, just be a little bit cautious, have the teeth separate, it makes your life a lot easier. The second part you have to be aware of is that it cannot, when you're taking CT, if there are too much artifact from the image, you just make your life very complicated because the image is just not validated enough for you to plan in the future. By saying so, that's, that's what you see on the screen. If there's too much stack, scatter, too much artifact that's introduced already at the pre-planning phase of your Combin CT, of course, you cannot, the software just cannot recognize what they're doing right now. For this step, if, you're in, if you have this pre-introducing um, scatter already in your CT, my best advice at this point is you have to just remove that. You have to remove, reduce as much, pos as, much, as much as possible all those artifacts, that's number one. Or if you really cannot remove that, then you have to just jump away those area by the uh, for you to register the information, meaning you have to add a couple of additional markers, landmarks. So I'm going to show you in the photo what am I talking about right now, which is from the last part. So when you capture the accurate, when you make sure the first scan is accurate, you make sure your CT data is correct, registering correctly, correct, registering properly. Then the last step for the superimposition, you have to be crucial. Uh, you have to be um, very careful as well, because. 
those two image when it's superimposed, sometimes it can be off. If it's off, that whatever you're following is actually not correct. So uh, let's let's take a look why would we need to do this both of these information superposition. And that tells you what actually the treatment planning, the treatment strategy has been shifting. There is a paradigm shift from um, you know, early maybe uh, 19th century until now when we first have the implants. Of course, a lot of people, they would like to do a bone drift and surgical phase. Wherever there's a bone, you shop in a couple implants. We feel secure because we are not so sure about you know, a, a lot of features of implants. And I'm not gonna just I'm not gonna talk about that too much, but of course nowadays we would like to carry on your surgical procedure based upon your prosthetic plan. That's called prosthetic driven of the surgical phase. The reason of that is because actually for patient, there's not a single patient walk into your office that they're looking for like the parallelism of the implant. Nobody knows about parallelism of the implant. Nobody cares about parallelism of the implant. What the patient really wants and the patient only care about is just give me the teeth back. I want the teeth to be look, to be able to look nice, to be able to talk, to be able to do all the social functions and as well as I can eat properly. You know, I just want to have the teeth. That being that, uh, that saying, when the patient walk into your office looking like that, what in their mind is they want their teeth. So you have to just try to put your teeth back. You have to see where the future design your teeth is going to be. Then you incorporate it and this bone information. So you start the planning according to your teeth, according to your bone. That is validated. That is, you know, really meaningful for yourself, not just for, you know, not for anybody else, but for yourself and for your patient. So at this point, you have both of the information, you put the teeth back, and then you put the bone information, you incorporate all this too, then you start to plan your implant. So for the this part of the supreme position, um, as I addressed previously, I will break down into two different cases type. So number one is the patient when they have some solid anatomy landmarks, as you can see from the scan file, the patient still have some teeth, that we can be utilized to put all these two information, your skin and then your bone information together in the software so they can recognize. And the solid landmarks that has to have, uh, that has to have couple features as the following I addressed. Number one is the, the landmarks has to be solid, meaning it cannot be mobile. If it's mobile, if it's moving everywhere, left and right, you basically just cannot achieve the accuracy because at the very starting point, you're introducing a lot of error. The second part is you want these landmarks to have a pretty good appreciation of the distribution, spatula-wise. So when you're synchronizing, when you're superimposition the information, you can achieve the accuracy. The last part is you want these landmarks to have some features. So when you're doing the verification, when you're doing the accuracy check, you know you're actually right at the damn point. So meaning you want to have some cusp tips probably or the incisor edge that you can always go back. So let's take a quick video at how we actually do when the patient has solid landmarks, how we choose our landmarks to superimpose those images. So you can see at the bottom, we, you know, we have the bone information as I keep on talking about, and then we have the scan STL that's been designed, which is your diagnostic wax up. So you choose on the um, anatomic solid anatomic landmarks that you want to utilize, meaning you don't want the teeth to be too mobile. The teeth is solid, it's, it stay there, and then you click on those. So at this point, once you, uh, superimpose those images, you can see those lines that now, you can see the lines that's overlaying on the tooth also along with your diagnostic wax up. So it's very important for you as a doctor to carry on before you put in those implant, before you plan the implant position and distribution, verifying whether this superimposition is accurate. If it's not accurate, then 
the plan is meaningless, as I keep on talking about. The way we verify the accuracy is we will double check on the border of the design teeth, whether it's all going along following by the solid landmarks, which is your teeth that you want to select it for superimposition. So you can see through the movie, there are red lines, which is your design, and also the border of the tooth, which is your CT. You want those two lines basically to overlapping everywhere around where your landmark is. Once you verify that, then you can carry on the plan as we just move around those implants. And at this point, you could be able to generate up at the end this STF file. Now you can see, you can appreciate that all the implant is following by your prosthetic position. And also you generate this information that's preparing for your full arch implant show. As I just talked about, there's a relieving hose that's been pre-designed, reducing your chair time. So this information can be done, can be registered, which is in a um, universal file, it's a STL file, through the Navident software. For the second type of the cases which you in, will encounter the most for your full mouth rehabilitation cases, that is with very limited of a landmarks. Sometimes you just won't get lucky to have those teeth that's not mobile. And especially for the complete dentalism case, you start with nothing. How are we going to do it then? So this is what we're gonna do. Um, we, with cases that just don't have solid landmarks, we basically, you have just created landmarks, right? So we will now just recommend you guys just to have a couple mini screw inserted in your case. And the way you inserted it, you wanted to have a better distribution. So spatula-wise, you can superimpose your image easier. Or you can add on some fiducial markers to increase the accuracy. You can add on your fiducial markers on whether your case has a pretty good bend of the kernel's tissue. Or you can create a prototype, the provisional restorations, overlaying on some of your teeth which is slightly mobile, but you splint them together, or the fiducial markers on your denture, but it has to have a better tissue adaptation. So the fiducial markers, it's important as I keep talking about, it has to stay constantly on your workflow because you need these fiducial markers, not only for the beginning of your planning, but also throughout the surgical procedure that you're going to carry it out. You wanted to calibrate your patient's condition to your plan. That's called a tracing procedure. And you also want the fiducial markers to stay at your surgery, which is your placing, your execution procedure, the step that you can constantly verify whether I'm, I'm at the, the right route, whether I'm going off or not. That's the accuracy check you have to do. So the fiducial markers needs to be there constantly before your surgery and also during your surgery. That's why we will recommend if you just don't have any landmarks to start with, play, have a couple mini implants in. That's gonna make your life a lot easier. If you don't want to have the mini implant in, you can choose to glue some of the fiducial markers on the kernel's tissue bit, but be very careful with this because um, these markers, as I said, as I mark with the star shape, you want to maintain it, not only before the surgery, but also during the surgery. If it move, then basically you just lost all the information. You will get very lost and the navigation cannot be executed. So right now, um, my team and me and my team, we basically just don't encourage the tissue landmarks as much. Instead, we will create a prototype, as I said, we create a denture. Instead of gluing the fiducias on the tissue, we actually glued it on your denture, the prototype. But the denture has to be seated properly. So there will be any error from the tissue or the movement while you're planning and as well as performing the treatment, the surgery. So this is the um, this is one of the examples that you can take a look. So we're basically superimposition both files utilizing those little balls and landmarks. And once we click on those, the ones that 
has the least gathering because any type, as you guys know, any type of radial opacity, we wanted to show reflect the opacity. There's, it's introducing slightly of the scatter rate. You want to choose the um, fiducials that has the least, it has the confine of the features, it has least of the scattering, then you click on that, you superimpose it, and you verify the superimposition, making sure the accuracy, that's the way to go. Then you can, once you verify the accuracy of the both imaging overlapping, then now you start to plan where, how your implants going to be, how many implants, where the position of the implants. So that's the part that I would like to share with you guys for the planning part. Let's carry on to the actual plan. And there are a couple little details that before the end of the session, I would like to share with you guys. So first, we capture the future teeth. We have the better appreciation of how we're going to restore back all those teeth. We merge with our bone information utilizing the Navidem software, and it, you're going to have information just look like this. Each of the implants, you verified it for your position you want to place, the angulation you want to achieve, and also the depth, whether you have the, enough restorative space for whatever type of the restoration in the future you want to have. If it's a full arch hybrid type, you're looking for the distance of the restorative space, we call running room. You're looking for that for around 12 to 14 millimeters. So those are the knowledge, the fundamental knowledge you have to incorporate during the planning. Here is the last part that I want to address as I mentioned about earlier. Through the planning part, you can actually introduce um, the pre-correction of the angulation information. What does that mean? So basically, nowadays, if you're working on the full mouth rehab cases, we're talking about on six, on four, on whatever, how many implants you're looking for. You want this prosthetic part to be screwy 10 and everything split together. So if it's screwy 10, you want the screw access hole actually not coming from, of course, the levial side or the incisal edge you want the screw access hole to coming out from the cingulum or the central fossa, just not following, just like what I was indicating in the yellow arrow. So by achieving so, sometimes you just don't have the bone to following by your plan. So you need to have a shift of this angulation and that's how we utilize this prosthetic part. It's called trismicosal abutment. You will hear it a lot. It's called multi-unit abutment. Ut utilizing this multi-unit button, you pre-correct the angulation of your implant so you can still be able to place the implant within the confine of the bone. So let's take a look at this example. If you look at the top part of the um, left corner, you will see the implant is actually the red dot at the Number eight, it's, uh, if you're, you're using the universe number, it's number eight of the tooth. If you're using the FDI number, it's the, it's the right central incisor. Okay. So the axis, it's the, where the axis is coming out according to your implant plan, that's from the labial surface. However, the bone is just like that. No matter how, how great you can actually grow the bone, you still need to place the implant somewhere inside the confine of the bone. You cannot just place it outside somewhere but you still want to achieve the screwy 10 implant practices split it all together, meaning you want the screw access hole to coming out actually from the singular. At this time, you just need to place, you need to utilize the multi-unit abutment I just addressed about. However, the benefit, the feature of the plant phase is you actually don't need to have like 20,000 million of the inventory stock of the multi-unit abutment, which is expensive. You can pre-plan how much angulation you want to turn and prepare accordingly. So for this case, as you can see, we're planning on the 17 degree of the multi-unit abutment we're going to use later on. Once you pre-plan, you pre-turn the angulation, then for getting back to your prosthetic part, the shell, the full arch shell with the drilling hole that you're preparing, you introduce this pre planning angulation correction and that's how you will get and that's how you can reduce your time 
during the phase as the end of the full arch implant workflow for your immediate loading provisional procedure. So if you follow everything, if every all the steps that's been checked correctly, at the surgery, after the surgery, at the time that you see your provisional shell, it should look like that. You, you basically don't need to adjust it much, to be honest. Another great feature for the planning phase is actually the dynamic plan. What's a dynamic plan? That is also the feature that I just talked about previously. The GPS does not only lead you, but it also constantly gives you the feedback of what's going on around. If the, this route has traffic or this route, there is something happen with the problem, I can detour it or I can switch another route. Same thing with Navidad. So with the navigation approach, when things just don't act as what you plan, meaning when you open up the site, the surgical area, sometimes the bone wouldn't be just solid as you're planning. You might need to just come up with a backup plan. For the static guy, you know, there are two different guys. For the static guy, when you need to change your plan, you basically need to drop the entire whole surgical kit out because the, the plan has been built within the static guy, the stereolithographic guy. You cannot just switch the implant position as what you wanted it because there is a physical guide there. With Nam with Navidad, everything's dynamic. So you can actually just switch your plan in the software, but still following the prosthetic plan, you can just shift the implant to another side, but still being able to achieve the screwy 10 um, prosthetic design, having the angulation coming out through the singular and then still finish it, call it a day. You might have the plan slightly off. You can see it's shifting from the, uh, the second bicuspid to the first bicuspid, but then still we could be able to carry out our procedure. That thing, so for the last part of if you're carrying out all your procedure with this high efficiency and with this high accuracy, the last part is literally you just drop it in easy as a piece of cake. So you can see you do the surgery and the plan, and you pick it up as the screwy ten four arch implant prosthesis. So you will have your patient before they walk into your office, and at the end, the patient can be um, you can achieve the patient in your great efficiency and as well as patient's high satisfaction. For that thing, so I'm gonna finish up my presentation. I really appreciate your joining today. For the last part, I, I always would like to acknowledge my mentor. This guy, he's the greatest guy on earth, Dr. Tarno. We always discuss about a lot of new protocols that created it. He continued to inspire me, and I want to especially address the problem now that everybody has been having in New York, especially, and all around the world. The coronavirus situation, I want you guys to just stay at home and be aware of that and just, you know, keep staying healthy. We can all overcome through it. That being said, Thank you very much for joining the course today. Thank you. Okay, um, we have some time for questions and answers. So we would like to um, give you this opportunity to type in any questions that you have and we can address them at this time. I think Dr. Okay. La Rosa still get muted. Okay. 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 There you go. I think she's still mute. I'm mute. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's good. That's good. All right. So, any questions um, from the attendees that we can address at this time? Feel free to type them in. Can you all hear me right now? Yes. Yep. Okay. Well. First of all, before the questions start, I just wanted to actually praise Dr. Quo for her outstanding presentation. Um, it was very detailed, very structured. Thank you so much. Um, definitely highlighting the, um, the importance of the diagnostics. It couldn't be more timely, um, as we all must remember how crucial this part is. The, the ideal virtual restorative plan is crucial on the digital workflow. And that is not only just 
from the planning phase, but also from the accurate execution of the procedures, right? So the digital, you know, seamless digital workflow will certainly minimize any improvisations and will certainly prevent any possible complications. So, you know, definitely we have some questions in the chat. I managed to answer some of them, um, but I will definitely like to go over those. Um, and also I have some questions of my own um, that I wanted to raise. Um, let me start with that real quick. Um, okay. One of the things that um, basically we talked is that within the digital workflow, there is some parts that might need to still be somewhat analog. Um, and Dr. Kwan and I have been having this discussion about, you know, the, the accuracy, especially for someone who's fully edentulous. So, Dr. Kuo, why don't you elaborate a little bit on the importance of, of that particular phase and how um, and what are the drawbacks if you were to go fully digital with that? Okay. Um, yeah, we actually talked about that yesterday because um, a lot of people, they're, um, they're elaborating full digital workflow. They're pushing the limit a little bit way too, way too much. Um, as I address for the intraoral scanning, um, full arch, especially full arch, completely dentalism scanning, it's, the technology is just not there yet. But utilizing the navigation system, as Dr. La Rosa just addressed, we want to have the accuracy for the planning phase. And of course, we executing it with the accuracy we are, so we can achieve the end result that's accurate. So basically, we're looking for the planning phase to be accurate. If scanning introduced too much of the arrow, then it's not accurate. So everything that you do following by your plan is basically just wrong. That being said, we want the register, we want the initial phase to be accurate. So we don't want to go full digital workflow at this point for the diagnostic phase, which is establishing your teeth on the complete digitalism case. So you can see on my case that, and also I discussed with Dr. La Rosa yesterday, on my complete dentalism case, at this point, I will still create a physical, either um, record-based and a wax ring, or a physical printout denture prototype, as I just show you guys with the fiducials. With that, then I would do the second scan on your record-based wax ring or on your prototype of the print dentures. So at this second scan, I can make sure that the first step of the teeth or all the prosthodontic core value, you know, the vertical dimension, the incisor edge position, the teeth, where the teeth are gonna be, can be accurate, register, and then carry on to your plan. So basically, if this point of the record-based wax room or you're altering your vertical dimension virtually, you're not sure whether your plan is correct or not, but then it will affect a lot for your end result, which is your surgical phase, because whatever you're doing is following from the beginning. If the beginning is not right, the end result will never be right. So we, at this point, because of intraoral scanning, it's not so accurate at this era, at this point, so we would like to have a physical um, stop for physical registration to get you close to the um, close there, which is the record-based physical record-based wax stream or the physical printout prototype denture. Right, right. Good, good, good. We have a question here from Dr. Adrian, Adriano Lara from Mexico City. I don't mm -hmm. know if you can see it there, uh, Dr. Quo. It's a rather long question, but... Um, for the planning phase, is it completely necessary to make two, two series CTs, basically? And could it be possible to make a orthopan uh, with approximation of the landmarks, you know, with the provisional denture? Um, yes, you can, I mean, sorry, can you repeat the question again? So basically, the, if it's completely necessary to take two series CTs, um, sure. And if it's possible to first take an orthopan with uh, landmarks that are approximated in the provisional denture, like you actually have done, you had a prototype with the landmarks, by the way, the right, crucial. Correct, correct. And then in the CVCT be more accurate. Well, I think that's pretty much what you were talking about. Yeah, prototype. that's correct. So, 
Right, correct. So we actually, we don't do twice of the CBCT. We create, so first we scan it, we plan on it, we have our prototype with the denture, either your denture or record-based wax stream or any type of provisional. Then you have the provisional with the fiducial markers, which is the landmarks you are going to use in the future. At that time, you rescan it, and you at that time, you take CBCT, so you don't overdose your patient by unnecessary radiation. And that's what my procedure is actually about. Got it. And that is definitely for the fully edentulous patient. When, when Correct. You have, of course, a partially edentulous patient, you probably don't need to go through all, you know, the dual CBCT, especially. Correct. Especially with uh, with Navidant, as we know, it's a fiducial independence, so we can definitely use the high contrast landmarks that are on the patient, which will be the teeth, or many times you can use an implant, a bracket, as a landmark to actually be able to trace, um, do your trace registration. Uh, but one of the differences between um, X Guide and, and Navidant, somebody was specifically asking about that, so I just wanted to address that. Mm -hmm. um, that this particular technology is fiducial independent and it is hand piece independent. So you don't depend on a, a form factor hand piece um, to actually do the procedure. As a matter of fact, um, you can move, you can use the navigation in your high speed, your low speed, your piezo, and like the competitor, which was one of the questions that was raised. I just wanted to bring that up. Correct. Um, Dr. Lorenzo is uh, talking about exactly, you know, how it's, we are utilizing it right now because it has so much freedom and we can, you know, basically you're not requiring so much of the fiducials as the other brand. You actually can trace on the landmark, which is solid, which is being able to utilize. It's highly recognized. That's why in the CPCT, you have to have the image being clear enough. You can use the cusp tip of your tooth if the tooth is not mobile. You can use the incisal edge, or as Dr. La Rosa said, you can use your implant if the implant did not introduce too much scatter at the face when you register your CT. So those are details that's crucial for you to get accuracy. That's why I keep talking about you know all this image and the intraoral scan. I think that the the you know that's what actually brings you success. Any other questions? I don't think practice. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for a fabulous presentation. And thank you, Sylvia, for moderating. You did a great job, as always. Um, and everybody for attending. I think if we go to the next slide, we have the link to the CE. So you can click on this and download your CE documents. If you have any questions, I'm going to type my um, email in here if for some reason you have questions about the CE. And also, again, I would encourage you to go on the ClaroNav website. I'll type that in too. Um, you can find all kinds of information about the system. And uh, also, you can also find out all kinds of information about the studies and our upcoming uh, webinar series inclusive of Dr. LaRosa's um, presentation coming up on April 29th. So thank you very much. Thank uh, you.